Welcome everyone who's able to be part of this workshop today. My name is Jennifer Sloot and I'll be moderating the panel discussion this afternoon. Um, I am the Executive Director of the Atlantic Council for the International Cooperation. I'd like to welcome you to the panel and to introduce our esteemed panelists. So to my right is Amy Middleton, who is a Senior Policy Analyst in the Accessibility Directorate in the Department of Justice for the province of Nova Scotia. Um, next to her on my screen anyway is Rachel Morgan, who is the Youth Program Manager at the Atlantic Council for International Cooperation. And beside her is Ashley Kopage, who's the Project Coordinator at the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the SDGs and education. Um, so I'll do a short intro and then we're going to have our panelists speak and then following that we'll have an opportunity for answering questions. So 10 years out from 2030, it's clear that some groups in Atlantic Canada are still being left behind. Indigenous communities, people with disabilities, immigrants and other populations still face more barriers than the general population when it comes to education, access to resources and others. In order to achieve the SDGs, serious action needs to be taken in these areas. In this session, we will be highlighting some of the work being done in the Atlantic region to close the inequality gap in traditionally underrepresented communities. Um, the first panelist will be Rachel Morgan, who works at the Atlantic Council for International Cooperation. At ACIC, we play a leadership role in the region in advancing the SDGs. We do this in two key areas. First, by increasing awareness about the SDGs, particularly targeting youth, and second, through bringing together key decision makers and actors to facilitate multi-sectoral dialogue. Panelist Rachel Morgan is ACIC's Youth Program Manager, and she's going to be speaking about her work in engaging traditionally underrepresented youth. At the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq, panelist Ashley Kopage works to remove financial, mobility, and structural barriers to solid waste management in Indigenous communities. Ashley's work takes a community-based approach. Ashley will be speaking about her work at CMM and sharing strategies that she has found useful in removing barriers. And finally, panelist Amy Middleton works at the Department of Justice, which administers the province's Accessibility Act. Amy's discussion will explore the challenges faced in improving accessibility for people with disabilities. And finally, our session will highlight the important role that networks and partnerships play in working towards the Sustainable Development Goals. As an umbrella organization, ACIC brings together groups across sectors who are working on the common goal of social justice, reduced inequalities, and dignity for all. Networks across the country and the world are critical to advancing the shared goals, and this session is one example of that work in action. So we'll pr proceed to the panel discussion and then move to the questions and answers from the audience, as I mentioned earlier. And I'd like to welcome our first panelist, Rachel Morgan. Over to you, Rachel. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, great to be here on this panel today, um, even though here has a different meaning now than it did a few months ago. So as Jennifer mentioned, I work for the Atlantic Council for International Cooperation. Um, and during the next five minutes or so, I just want to talk a bit about what we do to address inequality in the Atlantic and to work towards leaving no one behind, and then also why we take the approach that we take. So as Jennifer mentioned, we um, are one of eight regional and provincial councils across the country. I actually don't think she mentioned that part, but um, our mission is basically to build a um, just, equitable, uh, and sustainable communities locally and globally. So not a small task, um, but we do this using a two-pronged approach. So that's basically our membership, which Jennifer mentioned. And for us, that's a big piece of working towards STG 17, which is partnerships for the goals, um, especially in the Atlantic. Having partnerships is huge to getting the work that we want to get done completed. Um, but the part that I want to talk about the most is the youth piece. That's our second prong of what we do. And so we run a series of youth programs across the Atlantic um, and we run them for youth ages 15 to 35. So that's what the United Nations has um, said is the category of youth. Um, and so our different programs deal with different age categories, but broadly we include those, those ages. 
And we run programs related to the sustainable development goals and really letting youth know what they are. A lot of Atlantic youth don't have that background and more importantly, they haven't necessarily thought about how they connect to the issues in their communities. So that's a big piece of our work. Um, we also talk about global citizenship quite a bit. Um, you know, what is your role in your community? What's your role in Atlantic Canada and what's your role nationally and internationally? Um, and then we also focus a lot on critical thinking. So, you know, we, we ask the youth that, youth that we work with to question what narratives are they being told? How are they being delivered to them? Do they line up with the values that they have? So these are kind of the topics we cover with our youth and we do that in a number of different programs. So, uh, for example, we have a youth conference that happens every year and it's amazing to see because even though the four Atlantic provinces are quite small in a way, population wise, um, youth in, this, in these provinces have completely different experiences. So at this conference, we bring together youth from flying communities in Labrador with youth from rural PEI. Um, and they have a chance to have that peer collaboration piece, which is crucial, I think, to um, sharing common experiences, but also realizing what experiences aren't common across them and being exposed to things like that. Um, we also provide funding to youth to um, put on their own events in their communities and learn those project development skills and those event planning skills. And then we also have delegations that we send to places like the United Nations or to national conferences. So um, briefly, that's an overview of what we do in our youth programming. And I said at the beginning, I wanted to explain why we take the approach we take. So everything we do is focused on reducing inequalities and focused on promoting the SDGs. Um, and I'll give a couple examples of this, but basically we work in the informal education space and that really uh, looks at SDG four, which is quality education. And more specifically, um, 4.7 is uh, a target around sustainable development and teaching youth sustainable development. So that's actually written into the sustainable development goals. So why we do that with youth is that really they play a critical role in forwarding the SDGs. If you think of, you know, a 16, 17 year old now, by 2030, at the end of the decade of action, when the SDG mandate is up, they'll be 26, 27, they'll be entering a career, they'll be working professionally and having this background knowledge is crucial. So that's a big piece of why we're working with who we are. Um, another part of that is that honestly, youth are often people who are underrepresented in the sense that they're not really recognized for the authority that they have in decision making. I think often youth are seen as not having the experience or qualifications that they would need to um, make an impact. And that's something that we sort of try to challenge through the work that we do. Um, you hear a lot that youth are leaders of tomorrow, um, which I think plays a disservice to the crucial role they're actually playing in their communities. A lot of the youth we work with have the skills and have the knowledge to be making impacts in their communities, but often what's actually lacking is the tools to navigate the systems that are set up. So that's um, one of the things that is really interesting working with these youth is that they know what they want to do, they know what they want to change, but they don't necessarily know how to navigate that space. So even in having a delegation of youth engaged with policymakers, they can see this is how we engage, this is how we move our agenda forward. Um, so that's a big piece of, of what we're doing with youth and why we think that in a way youth actually are a little bit underrepresented and um, do fit into a bit of that inequality piece, especially in the Atlantic, because they don't always, they haven't always had the experience of having a voice. Um, another big piece of what we do is we've made the commitment to work with youth who are 65% uh, of our programs are full of youth who are from underrepresented backgrounds. So it's an interesting term. It's an interesting number. We could have a whole separate panel on um, how we came up with those or what underrepresented means. But for us, that's looking at youth who are from say rural communities, with youth who are indigenous, youth who are newcomers, youth who basically haven't had the opportunity to experience programs like this before or be in a space of power before. So for us, that's really a crucial part of moving the SDGs forward, but also um, decreasing inequality in the Atlantic is that if there's youth who have not traditionally been at these seats of power and at these tables, we need to look at why they haven't been there and overcoming the barriers to make sure that they do get to those spaces. Um, so that's 
a large part of what we're looking at and we're very intentional about that in all of our work. And just to finish that off, um, one of the approaches that we take in all of our programming is a nothing about us without us approach. You might have heard that term before, but I think it perfectly captures what it means when decisions about youth are being made without them present at the table. I think this is something that we're getting better at as a society. We're able to um, have youth on boards, have youth on committees, and really get their input when it comes to making decisions about them. But um, there's still work to be done there. And I think when it comes to issues that affect youth, they should not only be at that table discussing it, but they should also be equipped with the tools they need to have those conversations and get those points across. So that's what we try to do in our work. Um, there's a lot more to unpack there, but I'll leave it at that for now and pass it over to Jennifer. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rachel. That was great. Um, and I will pass it over now to Ashley, who will speak next. Great, thanks, Jennifer. Um, so my name is Ashley Kofi, and I'm really excited to be here today. Um, and I have a background in health sciences and education. And right now I'm working as a project coordinator for the Mi'kmaq Green Communities Program. Um, and that is a program administered by the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq. Um, and just about the Confederacy, um, it is a tribal council and it represents the eight mainland Mi'kmaq communities in Nova Scotia. Um, and so the Mi'kmaq Way Green Communities Program, I'll call it MGCP from now on probably, um, it's administered by that. And the program began um, by conducting needs assessments, creating an advisory committee made up of representatives from each of our eight community members and conducting waste audits. And from the information that we gathered in these activities, um, our MGCP started initiatives such as household hazardous waste collection events, community-based compost sites, diversion center feasibility studies, and solid waste management education that is relevant for all ages from uh, youth up to elders. Um, and our program has grown considerably over the last four years. Um, and we now offer regional level support our Diversion Starts at Home project, which I can talk about a bit later, um, straight across the province. Educational resources for parents and teachers to use at home and in schools. And we have stepped into marine waste management through our Go Scare in Mi'kmaq project. Uh, it's on the go right now as well. Um, our general program is, um, the biggest one would be that salt waste management is a municipal responsibility in Nova Scotia. Um, and our communities are in a gray area here because they are federally regulated, um, but their waste does have to go to municipal facilities. Um, and technically the municipal, the municipal facilities don't really need to accept the waste from our communities um, as they're not part of the yeah, municipality itself. Um, so our communities can be forced to pay commercial level fees for higher drop-off fees at the sites. Um, and then on top of that, the municipal educators that are responsible for um, doing what we do in communities, which would be educating um, community members on how to sort waste, are not always available to our Mi'kmaq communities. Um, each community is different with the relationship with their neighboring municipality. Um, so if your waste isn't sorted properly, you're going to get charged a higher fee um, and your waste can be turned away if it's not properly sorted at any time. Um, so we're trying to work towards bridging the service gaps between our member communities um, and other communities in Nova Scotia. And our program is aiming for our communities to be leaders in solid waste management. That's all I have for now. And thank you, Jennifer. Okay. Thanks very much, Ashley. And last but not least, we have Amy Middleton. Thank you. So I work in the Accessibility Directorate with the provincial government in Nova Scotia. Um, we're situated in the Department of Justice. And I'm just gonna provide some very brief context for the accessibility policy landscape here and then focus in on the collaborative partnership work that's underway to improve access to education for persons with disabilities. Um, so Nova Scotia's Accessibility Act was enacted in 2017. We're one of just three provinces to have accessibility legislation after Ontario and Manitoba. 
And of course, the Federal Accessible Canada Act passed last year as well. It's important to note that Nova Scotia has the largest percentage of persons with disabilities of any province or territory in Canada. About 30% um, of our population identify as having a disability compared to 22% nationally. So it's pretty significant. The accessibility legislation is um, unique for Nova Scotia in that it was developed collaboratively with persons with disabilities. In fact, for the first time ever, um, government solicitors actually sat at the table with community members to draft the legislation, um, which was a, a pretty unique situation. The Act has a goal of an accessible Nova Scotia by 2030, and it recognizes accessibility as a human right, which was a big change. Our previous legislation was really couched in a social services model of disability and accessibility, and that's why we're situated within the Department of Justice. So the legislation enables government to develop standards or regulations to prevent and remove barriers to accessibility in six areas. Um, education is one of them, as well as information and communication, um, access to employment, the delivery and receipt of goods and services, accessible transportation, and of course the built environment, which is buildings and outdoor spaces. And when you read the app, um, as I'm sure many people spend hours and hours reading the legislation, um, you can really see the impact in that legislation of having persons with disabilities involved in shaping it. Woven throughout the legislation is the importance of first voice and collaborating with the disability community to implement the, the legislation. So I'm just going to focus on education today, which is just one of many areas that the directorate is working to ensure equitable access to participation for persons with disabilities. Um, recently, a number of public sector bodies were given obligations under the Accessibility Act, including the public education sector. So that includes amongst others, uh, universities, as well as the regional centers for education, which um, are the bodies that administer K-12 education here in our province. So this means that those entities must establish an accessibility advisory committee and develop accessibility plans uh, and, and comply with those standards when they're developed and enacted. And I wanted to just share what the post-secondary sector is doing um, to prepare for this work. They are taking a, a unique approach um, and collaborating. The universities and the Nova Scotia Community College are working together um, to draft a provincial post-secondary accessibility framework for the, for the sector. And the objective of that work was twofold. One, they wanted to establish a common vision for accessibility across the post-secondary sector in, in the province. And they also wanted to provide a foundation of shared commitments that they all agree to, which would then inform the development of those um, accessibility plans that each institution will be developing. And the framework has shared principles and goals um, and fairly specific, in some cases, commitments in about seven, I think there's seven areas of accessibility. Um, finally, I wanted to share some information about accessibility standards that are being developed in education. As I said, there are six areas in the Act where government can develop regulations. And education was identified through public consultation as the priority for one of two standards that we would start with in the province. The other one that's being developed is in the built environment. Um, the scope of the standard includes both public and private, early childhood, primary, secondary, and post-secondary education. So it's pretty huge. And it'll address areas, pretty much everything that's not buildings and, and outdoor spaces. So um, teaching and learning practices, curriculum and materials, access to assistive technology, communication and navigation of the system, um, professional development for educators and others working in the system. Um, and the standard is first um, being worked on by a committee of community members. So 
there's a standard development committee as well. Uh, in addition to, to community members, there are a couple of government representatives as well. And they're developing recommendations for government on what that standard should look like. The majority of those members, and this is outlined in the legislation, are persons with disabilities. So it really brings that first voice perspective to the table. And they have a really broad and diverse range of expertise in education across that scope um, from early childhood up to post-secondary. Part of their challenge was that there is no other province in Canada that has accessibility standards in education, so there was no precedent that they could um, start as a foundation with. Um, and obviously the scope of the sector and the issues that they're considering are just huge. So they decided to take a phased approach and they're developing their recommendations for government in three phases. They're almost finished their first phase, um, which are fairly high level uh, recommendations for imperatives and commitments. And then the next two phases will be more specific recommendations for regulation. And I can share a little bit more about that in the Q&A, but really at the core of those recommendations, the committee um, has committed to, um, there's really a foundation upon which all of their recommendations are built is this fundamental commitment to education, um, uh, equitable access to education as a human right. Um, and everything else is, is kind of flowing from that. So I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Amy and Ashley and Rachel. Um, I think you all did an excellent job in laying the groundwork for this discussion. Um, I'm going to, since I'm the moderate, moderator, take the liberty of asking you all one question before we go to the participants um, for any questions that they might have. And I should say, um, in case it wasn't clear, the, the question and answer button is, um, is down at the bottom of your screen. So if you have any questions for all of the panelists or any individual panelists, you can write them in the Q&A section and we'll be sure that those get addressed. But my question, um, this panel, as we mentioned at the beginning, is about leaving no one behind and this idea that we're all working together to achieve the SDGs by 2030. And you have all talked about particular groups or um, are people that are very much at risk in of being left behind in terms of the sustainable development goals. So could you um, could you tell me a little bit more? Maybe give your top two or three recommendations about um, how we can be sure that your the the specific group that you're speaking of doesn't get left behind. And uh, I'll just jump in. Whoever wants to go first, I can go. Um, so who's at risk of being left behind? I mean, in the work that I was just describing, certainly all persons, students with disabilities or potential students with disabilities. Um, and the work is addressing not just physical disabilities, but students with learning disabilities, mental health issues, complex health issues, cognitive disabilities. The, the definition is quite broad. And not just getting in the door to education, but making sure that once you're in the system, you're having um, your access to learning is, is equitable and you have materials and curriculum and services um, just like students who don't have disabilities. Um, rather than giving my recommendations, I think it makes more sense to share some of the recommendations of the, the community, the Standards mm -hmm. Development Committee that have been doing this work. Um, and I can share some of their, what they're calling imperatives for success. So these are some of the uh, critical conditions that they say must exist for persons with disabilities not to be left behind in the education system. Um, as I said, first and foremost, human rights. We have to prioritize equitable access to education as a human right. Um, first voice is essential that, um, persons with disabilities have to be valued as experts in accessibility in the work. Um, inclusive decision making is a really big piece of this puzzle, making sure that students with disabilities and their families have the support and the tools to be full active participants in decision making, which is like was 
so much of what Rachel was saying about youth was so relevant to um, to the work that that we do. Um, collaboration, I think, is a big one. We have to prioritize collaboration and coordination among all the stakeholders and initiatives and communities and sectors. Um, and also, I think a big one, or the the committee um, has has recommended. Um, one of the imperatives is understanding intersectionality and all of these issues um, that uh, there's such diversity of disabilities and also other identities and circumstances and experiences um, all intersect and impact accessibility and access um, and um, to education and obviously to other aspects of society. So those are just a few of the recommendations that I borrowed from from the experts that I work with. Thank you, Amy. And um, Rachel or Ashley, do you have a response for that question? Uh, yeah, I can go next. Uh, this is Ashley. Um, and I can give an example from uh, our largest project right now I mentioned earlier, the Diversion Starts at Home project. Um, so this project is a province-wide initiative that we're doing where we are setting up our community members with um, end of driveway roll carts that are usually provided by a municipality, as well as an indoor sorting system and all the supplies and education that would go with, along with that. Um, and we designed this in a way, um, hopefully it seems to be working so far to address community and individual uh, inequalities. Um, so the first one that we, so a lot of these things we didn't go in thinking about, but as we went through the project for each community, we saw them and we tried to address them as they went. Um, so the first was those living with the restricted mobility. Um, so a lot of these people self-identified to us when we were going door to door to educate them on the sorting rules in the community. Um, and then we passed this information along to the community-based waste coordinators and they were able to, in many cases, set up a community member or a family member to that person who can't take a big roll cart and put it to the end of their driveway when it's full of waste. Um, another one was people without access to the internet or phone. Uh, if that's how you get all your sorting information is sort social media or a website. Um, not everybody has access to that. So we would go to every single person's door and chat with them. Sometimes it was 10 minutes and we were done and sometimes we sat down for an hour and chatted and we had tea and it was really great. And we had a really great personal connection with that, those people that they wouldn't have gotten any information if we relied only on digital forms. Um, we also went into the schools to talk to the youth as well through the teachers. Um, and the third example would be those who can't afford recycling or composting products. So something we think about all the time is if someone has a limited budget, they're going to choose food or other necessities for their family over a second colored bag for their waste. Um, so when we did do this project, it was completely free to all the community members and we tried to think about how much a family of four would use in a year and that's what we provided. Um, so hopefully that addressed the top three things we saw. And I think overall, um, I think it's just building relationships is the best way to prevent inequality, at least in the solid waste management sector that I see, but I think in a lot of sectors as well. Thank you, Ashley. And Thanks, I'll Jennifer. <laughs> yeah, so um, I think this actually ties in nicely with what Ashley was saying. Um, obviously, youth as a whole is a huge group and not all youth are being left behind. I think a lot of youth are leading the way. Um, but there are communities or populations or individual youth who don't have access to some of the things that really would help strengthen their um, ability to act as citizens in their communities and in society. I think um, there's a limit to what they learn in the classroom or from families. And I think there's a huge value in being in spaces that are diverse and have different types of people and where youth are safe to express their opinions and talk about what they care about um, and get support for that. So um, when it comes to who is being left behind and who's most at risk, I think any of the programs, sorry, any of the programs that we do, um, we 
often have to do outreach to these youth. And what we see a lot of the time is that you can't access everyone. And it takes quite a long time to actually make those connections and form those relationships as Ashley was saying. And so just to give a couple examples, you know, if we post an application online saying, we're having a program, it's doing this, one, rural communities don't always have access to that internet. They might not be seeing that. And especially during COVID when everyone is online, we're running a program now that we would love to have more youth there who just can't be there because they don't have access to stable internet. Um, so we're making accommodations and saying, we've pre-recorded it, we've sent it to you, you can submit your materials in other ways, but that's a huge barrier. Um, outside of COVID, I think one of the barriers that we see a lot is honestly cost. Um, if we're working with youth in Labrador, let's say, it costs about $2,500 for a flight to Halifax. Um, and that's a huge barrier. And I think that's something that is across sectors and across people is that it does need that extra, extra financial support. And same goes for if there's a youth whose English is not their first language and there needs to be interpretation, that's an extra cost. So I think when it comes to barriers, everyone has good intentions but there's time and resources and capacity that's needed to make sure that everyone who needs to be there is there and that's not to mention that a lot of communities um, maybe don't have those relationships developed and that is the first step you don't just go in and say we're going to do this cool program we think it would be good for you join in people won't join if they hear that they they need to know why should we do this is this aligned with our goals and maybe it's not and that's part of the conversation too so i think there's a lot of even just getting the youth who need to be at these things to the table takes a lot of work and a lot of effort that a lot of places pay lip service to and i think when it comes to reality and putting it into practice it's a lot of time and effort and i think so moving into the recommendations for that um, that needs to be recognized at all different levels. So on the level of say us, ACIC, we need to build that into our work plans, we need to build that into our timelines, but we also need to make sure that the people funding our projects know that this is the reality and that it may take longer or there may, mean, there may need to be padding in the budget um, to allow for things like interpretation or to allow for flight costs. Um, so those are just a couple examples, but I think there's, when you get into the nitty gritty of it, getting youth engaged who have not been engaged before um, takes a lot of creativity and collaboration and um, a lot of humility in recognizing that you can set up the most amazing program and you'll think that they'll get everything out of it. And at the end of the day, they might not show up or it might not be something that they value right now. And that's something that you need to encounter. Thanks very much, Rachel. So we have four questions that um, so far that have come from uh, the participants and I'll just ask them in the order in which they were received. So the first question is for all the panelists. And the question is, what role do you see organizational partnerships playing in reducing inequalities in Atlantic Canada? Does anyone wanna tackle that one or more than one person? Um. I think it's everything <laughs> when you're talking about or exploring solutions to issues of inequality they're so complex and ingrained and um, crossing all sectors um, that I don't think any real meaningful change can happen unless um, you're collaborating with folks outside your own bubble um and in fact collaborating with with folks that you might not think you need to collaborate with those are probably the most important um collaborations the ones that take you out of your comfort zone but yeah i would i i just think it's the crux of this work if it's going to be successful and rachel or ashley any would you like to provide a response for that question yeah, I think Amy hit the nail right on the head. Um, partnerships um, between communities, between organizations like us and organizations we work with like Divert Nova Scotia. Um, it's the most important part of our work, I think for sure, is partnerships. Um, and I can add to that, I agree with what both of you said. And I think on top of that, there's a particular importance in Atlantic Canada because 
organizations are smaller, there may be less funding. I think there's an added importance of partnerships because we don't necessarily have the resources that bigger provinces have or bigger uh, regions have. So um, that just makes it even more important to collaborate and uh, be working on these things together. Thank and you. it also provides an opportunity in our region because we are so small, I think it makes us more nimble to be able to form those partnerships and navigate across sectors in ways that larger jurisdictions might not be able to. Thank you. Uh, the next question that we have, um, it doesn't say whom it's to, so anyone can jump in on this one. How can we ensure that some of the ideas used in Canada to ensure that no one is left behind can be implemented globally? Huh. I think um, what Rachel said about nothing without, nothing about us without us, something I like to use a lot too, but I think globally we're being processed. Let them take a Yeah. Um, I can muddle through an answer to that. I don't know if I can cover that whole thing, but I think um, we see that in Canada, we don't necessarily have all of our different sectors and our, the issues in the different sectors figured out. And so I think often there's an assumption that quote unquote developed countries can then give advice to others. And I think in some ways that might be true. I think Canada's leading in a lot of ways, but in a lot of other ways, there's innovative approaches that we are not using that other countries are using. So, um, you know, I, th I think there's a lot being done here in Canada to um, be aware of the issues that we're facing. And especially when it comes to youth, I think we're, we're very good at being educated around different issues and the right terminology to use and being accepting of everyone, at least um, in, we try to put that into practice and I think we're further ahead than some countries in that way. So particularly when it comes to youth, there is a level of inclusion and recognition of diversity that um, is maybe unique to uh, Canada more so than other countries, but I do think we still have a lot to learn and a long way to go. Yeah, I mean, similar to Rachel, I think um, accessibility is fairly new in this country in terms of policy and legislation. And so we are often looking to other countries that have been doing this work for a lot longer. Um, some European countries, the United States um, has had federal legislation for a very long time. Um, and in fact, the um, you know, I think the SDGs really provide um, a nice framework for that. And in fact, the um, UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities visited Canada last year and pointed that out as an opportunity. There is no national implementation policy for the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And she said, listen, you're doing um, all this work on the SDGs and um, that's a really great opportunity to integrate um, the rights of persons with disabilities throughout so many of, of the goals and, and in that work. So, um, I mean, we're doing a lot of great work and the federal legislation I think is gonna make, bring about a lot of change and provinces, there are three provinces now with legislation and, and lots more following. Um, but uh, there are also, as Rachel said, really great examples outside of Canada that we can look to to inform our work both federally and provincially. Thank you, all of you. Um, next question is from Sylvia and it's directed to Rachel, but I imagine that if Amy and Ashley had something to add, that would be welcomed. Um, Rachel, you're absolutely right. Youth are are the leaders of today. Can you share with us ways in which we can digitally empower extremely marginalized youth and engage them in decision making, uh, engage them in decision making during these times? That's a, that's a big question as well. Good luck to you, Rachel. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think that's a tricky one. I think for a lot of the reasons that I mentioned before, even just the fact that internet is a challenge and that we can't get to people to have those discussions in person is a huge barrier and at least right now we can't 
overcome that safely. Um, it would be doing more harm to try to overcome that. So I think in the current COVID-19 situation, it's a bit of a different question, but I think moving forward from that, well, maybe I can speak to um, one of the examples that we're trying to work on now at ACIC. So we're putting together a, a project that launched a few weeks ago called uh, a photo voice project, and it's using a participatory research action technique, um, which is basically youth taking photos of their experiences in, in their communities, in their homes right now. And um, those weekly workshops are happening with youth across the Atlantic. Um, you know, we have youth who are uh, lobster fishermen on islands in outside of Digby who are participating. And then we also have um, youth in Newfoundland on remote communities participating. And they're um, coming together every week and sharing the pictures they've taken based or on the questions that they've been guided by. And it's it's sort of a way to have a capsule of what's going on now um, with COVID-19 and a way for them to share like their experiences and have a chance to debrief that with other youth and and collaborate across these boundaries because they're having in one way the same experience but another way different different experiences. Um, so I think we're touching on a couple of those groups there. But I mean what I think about is who hasn't signed up and who doesn't have time to sign up. And you know if you're working full time because you don't have the money to um, keep supporting yourself, then you're not going to be able to have an extra three to five hours a week to take photos. And we are giving incentives. We do have honorariums for the youth. And that does mean that it can support them in some way to be part of the process. But um, I think sometimes these types of programs aren't the priority if youth are struggling in other ways. So um, if anyone has innovative suggestions, happy to hear them. It's a constant evolving conversation. Thank you, Rachel. And Amy and Ashley, did you have anything you wanted to add to that question? Uh, just that, I mean, I think this current COVID-19 situation is really interesting um, as it relates to digital access and, and participation in society through digital means. And certainly persons with disabilities have been advocating for <laughs> remote participation in a lot of different ways for, for many years. And um, I think while this situation kind of illuminates inequities in a lot of ways, um, it's also opened up a lot of opportunities and shown a lot of us um, who have always done things the same way just because it works for us that in fact we can do things differently. I mean, this conference is one example. <laughs> we can have this conference remotely um, and it opens up access to all kinds of folks who wouldn't be able to access it um, in person. So um, yeah, I think I really hope that in terms of the digital world and access, uh, remote access that we um, stay tuned into how we have changed our way of doing things and how we can, you know, continue to improve and try and overcome some of those barriers that Rachel mentioned, but um, it has been, I, th I think it's opened up a whole other world of opportunity in that, in that arena. Thanks, Amy. And Ashley, did you want to weigh in on that one? We have one more question after this. I think they said all the words I wanted to say. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we're on to our last question from Nina. Thank you to all the panel speakers. Community-based participatory approaches are often used as an approach to meaningfully engage marginalized communities. What other strategies can be used to inform equitable policies for the future? And that is a really good question. I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is, um, I mean, the best way to meaningfully engage marginalized or underrepresented communities is to, um, not just ask for their input, but hire them. <laughs> you know, let's make the decisions, pool of decision makers and policy makers more diverse and more representative of the communities that will be impacted by those policies. So certainly we need to continue with the community-based participatory approaches and 
and engage and consult in meaningful ways, but I think we also need to um, do a better job of making sure um, there's diversity at the decision-making table and around that table as well. Thanks, Amy. And Rachel and Ashley, did you want to add anything to that? Ashley. I think Amy made some really good points about um, hiring people of diverse backgrounds to help bring diversity in to policy. Um, and it reminded me of something that I've heard before, instead of bringing um, underrepresented groups to the table, um, let them help set the table is a metaphor I've heard and I really like that. That's all I have to add, thank you. <laughs> and Rachel? Um, I, I like both those points and I like the metaphor about setting the table. I think, especially when it comes to youth, I heard one of the other panels before this, someone said that um, it's about actually meaningfully giving some of the power over to youth. Um, you know, I think people talk about it a lot and they have the best intentions and then they don't necessarily know how to follow through or especially if you're talking to policymakers, they're often saying we need to sit with youth and we need to talk to youth and engage them and hear their ideas. But largely what that ends up looking like is policymakers saying why the ideas aren't possible or why they can't make them happen and not necessarily giving the space for the youth to share and then saying, okay, well, maybe we need to rein it in a bit or maybe we need to adjust this or maybe it'll be a longer process than you expect but actually taking their ideas at face value and working with them so um i was at a, a conference at one point that really stuck with me because they had uh, a, a youth group represented there and the youth were supposed to introduce the different speakers who were going to ask questions to some uh, to some policymakers in the room and the youth actually took the microphones and basically just started asking their own questions and just claimed that space because they hadn't had a chance to do that. Um, and so it's a balance of meeting in the middle, I think. Uh, and I'm not sure if that answers that question, but those are some of the thoughts that I have roughly around that area. Thank you for that, Rachel, um, and Ashley and Amy as well. That looks like we've answered all of the questions that have been asked and i think that we may actually get kicked out of this room very soon um so i'd like to take this opportunity to thank amy and rachel and ashley for their time and the work that they took to um to prepare for the panel today um i certainly as um as the moderator, I hadn't hadn't had a chance to hear what the panelists were going to speak, and I found it really fascinating to to hear about the work that's happening uh, in the Atlantic region. And I wanted to thank you all for your thoughtfulness and for your um, answering the interesting questions that were posed by the audience as well. And I hope that we can continue to have this discussion over the rest of the conference and uh, then onwards until 2030. So thank you very much, everyone. And thank you all for being part of this, uh, this workshop. And we look forward to speaking to you afterwards.